Hello and welcome, dear saints of St. Peter Evangelical Lutheran Church and all of our other dear brothers and sisters in Christ who are joining us here today uh, yet again for another study. I uh, certainly want to thank you for tuning in here with us today. Uh, and as you know, throughout this week, on Tuesday, we started a study on the book of Philippians, a wonderful chance to dive into that letter from St. Paul uh, as he writes that even in his imprisonment focusing us on the great joy that is ours in Christ. Uh, and then yesterday we had our hymn study where we studied the hymn, My Song is Love Unknown. And I know yesterday we had some issues with our live stream video, uh, kind of kept stopping and starting. Uh, we think we figured out what that was a little bit. I uh, think we had some internet issues here over in the church. So we went ahead and moved back over uh, into my study here. Hopefully that'll help uh, kind of take care of that problem. But if it doesn't, uh, please let me know in the comment section. We have a few little uh, tweaks we can do to, to hopefully take care of that and make sure the video is working properly. So let me know uh, if that video is kind of stopping and starting for you. Uh, and we'll, we'll take it down, make those few tweaks, and then we'll get going again. Uh, so let me know in the comment section if that's the case uh, for you today. Now, I've kept you in a little bit of suspense here as to what our next topic is going to be. Uh, we did Philippians. We're doing a hymn study. Thursdays had not really been announced. Well, uh, the announcement is here. We will be studying from the Book of Concord, uh, this book of confessional writings from the Lutheran Fathers that lays out the faith so well, so beautifully. Uh, it's a book full of documents that we subscribe to as Lutherans because they are in accord with the Word of God. And there'll be a little bit more here on our specific topic as we get started. But for now, why don't we open with a word of prayer? We pray. Merciful God, we humbly implore you to cast the bright beams of your light upon your church, that we, being instructed by the doctrine of the blessed apostles, may walk in the light of your truth and finally attain to the light of everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. Well, as I said here, we'll be picking up our Book of Concord here today uh, and, and reading through parts of the large catechism. Now, before we actually get into that, I want to do a little bit of kind of introduction to the large catechism, but also want to remind you, you know, if you don't have one of these at home, if you don't have a Book of Concord, first, I encourage you to, to buy one, to get one. Uh, it's a great book to have uh, for yourself, to have at home, a wonderful research, resource to tor turn towards whenever you might have a question about the faith. But if you don't have one at home, you can also go to bookofconcord.org. That's bookofconcord.org. And the entire Book of Concord is on there as well. So if you want to follow along, uh, have that text up there with you. It is on there. Uh, but the one thing I will let you know, there will be some slight translation uh, differences. That will be, those are kind of two different translations. The one that's online versus the one that I will be using. But that's one way that you can do, uh, that you can actually have that text of the Book of Concord uh, if you don't have the physical book with you. Now with that, uh, let's get into the, the large catechism here with kind of a brief introduction to it. Uh, you know, everyone uh, who's a Lutheran has gone through the small catechism. You've been through that catechesis class, that confirmation, uh, where you've gone through the small catechism. You've probably memorized it, uh, you know, starting with the Ten Commandments, working your way on through. And so we're all very familiar with the small catechism, but we're not really that familiar with the large catechism. But really, they're both doing the same thing, just in a little different ways. So the small catechism, uh, Martin Luther writes this, he compiles these questions, he gives the meanings for them, uh, and he instructs that this small catechism is really to be used by fathers, to be used by the head of the household to teach his family. And so that's a wonderful encouragement even to us. Uh, to pick up our small catechisms, to look at them, to read them together as a family. And fathers, for you, uh, it's a wonderful encouragement to, to take that up, to be the lead, uh, to be the example in that, to teach your children, teach your even your spouse, your entire family, to teach them the faith. There, there's no greater gift you could ever give them than the faith, than picking up that book and studying it with one another. 
And so the small catechism is a great place to start. It gives you all kind of the, the basis, the foundation of the faith, and it gives it to you in a plain and simple way, as Martin Luther says. But then we have the large catechism, which, as I said, will cover all of the same information. It goes through all those chief parts and uh, kind of does it in the same order for the most part here. And yet the large catechism is really a series of sermons that Martin Luther had given on the small catechism, on each of those parts. And they compile it together. They made this document called the large catechism. And he gives the encouragement, not only to fathers, to the, to the head of the household, but also to pastors and churches to use the large catechism. That the large catechism, uh, kind of as the name implies, will really flesh out the small catechism, will give us kind of more meat on the bones, if you will. It'll help give us that fuller understanding of what the faith really is. And so the large catechism is truly a wonderful gift to us, especially uh, as you seek to kind of dig deeper into the faith, uh, that it is a wonderful place for us to start. Now, with that all being said, we're not going to read through the entire large catechism in our, in our time together on these videos. I wish it were so, uh, but we also have to start somewhere. And I thought maybe the best place for us to start is really right towards the very end with the sacrament of the altar. And that's where we're going to begin today. We're going to start with the sacrament of the altar where we're going to consider what the Lord's Supper is and see how it is so central to our life as Christians that we would much rather have everything taken away from us than to be taken away from the Lord's Supper. And Luther is going to kind of play with this idea and he's going to think about it and he's going to really show us what's happening there. That the Lord's Supper is really a feast. It doesn't look like it to our eyes and yet it is the greatest gift, the most wonderful feast that we could ever have. And so we're going to dive into that part. This is part five of the large catechism. So if you have it uh, at home, you have this edition in particular. It's on page 431. Page 431 is where we'll start. Uh, if you're using the online version, you can just quick uh, click large catechism and then go down to the part that says the sacrament of the altar. And so with that, uh, I see a couple comments already. Uh, so sounds like our feed is working pretty well. Uh, hello, Barb. Uh, nice to see you guys here with us here today. But as always, any questions that you have as we're going through this, any comments you want to make, uh, if anything's unclear or you want more information, uh, feel free to leave a comment on the video there, and I'll do my best to get to those. Uh, and that way we can have a really good study with one another. Any questions that come up can be answered, hopefully, uh, as soon as I see them here. But with that, let's go ahead and dive into the large catechism on the Lord's Supper. And kind of the way we'll do this is I'll, I'll read through usually about a paragraph, and then we'll kind of digest it. We'll, we'll sit on it for a minute or two, think about what was said, and uh, see what uh, really we are learning here about this great sacrament. And so we start here on page 431. Luther writes, Just as we have heard about holy baptism, so we must also speak about the other sacrament in these same three points. What is it? What are its benefits? And who is to receive it? And all these points are established through the words by which Christ has instituted this sacrament. Everyone who desires to be a Christian and go to this sacrament should know them. For it is not our intention to let people come to the sacrament and administer it to them if they do not know what they seek or why they come. The words, however, are these. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
We'll stop right there for now and kind of see how Luther is giving us the introduction, uh, really, for this whole part of the sacrament. You know, in particular, he, he mentions to us, you know, uh, we skipped right past it for now, but he said, okay, we've considered holy baptism, and now we'll move on to the Lord's Supper. And I think this is good for us just to real briefly pick up on that, uh, that what happens in holy baptism? Well, in holy baptism, we are uh, regenerated. We are killed and made alive. We are given the faith. We, because ultimately, in holy baptism, we are joined into Christ's death which means we have actually died. And we are joined into his resurrection, which means we are actually made alive again. We are resurrected, never to die again. You know, this is a beautiful thing that even on Sunday we'll hear in the raising of Lazarus, which is our gospel reading for this coming Sunday. But it is also for us our identity, that the world loves to kind of put an identity on us, to try to make us think about who we are, you know, and you can put any label you want on it. And yet, for us as Christians, our identity is rather simple. Uh, I'm not man or woman. I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm not a Hoosier or a Boilermaker. Those aren't our identity. Our identity as a Christian is that we are baptized. I am baptized. That's my identity. I am one who's died in, with Christ. And I am one who's been raised to new life with him as well. And what a beautiful identity that is. That if I'm going to be known by anything, I pray it's that. And I pray that that's the way for all of us. That that is our identity. That's how we think of ourselves. That's how we consider ourselves. That we have been washed clean. We have been saved from our sins. We have received forgiveness, life, and salvation because we are joined into Christ. And so Luther reminds us, even before we get to the sacrament of the altar, that we need to recognize that, that our life, our very life as a Christian, flows out of our baptism. And that's a beautiful place to start it, that we are baptized into Christ. And so then, as he kind of gives us that gentle reminder to begin with our baptism, he gives you kind of an outline for what this whole article is going to be. He says, there's three questions, three points that we want to consider with the Lord's Supper. The first point, what is it? Pretty basic question. What is this supper? What, what makes up the Lord's Supper? The second question, what are its benefits? So, what is it? And then, well, what's it going to do, right? What's the purpose of having this supper? And then the third question, who is to receive it, right? And this is an important one. Uh, if once we understand what it is, once we understand what it does, then we also want to know, well, who's it for? Do we just give it out to everyone or is it for certain people? Is there a use uh, for it that, that it's for a certain group? Well, we're going to dive into that question uh, probably in the next week or two. But Luther says that's kind of the third point we're going to get to. And so he lays out those three, and then he gives us, uh, and I, I want you to kind of keep your ears open for this as we read through this large catechism, that he says, all these points are established through the words. Through the words. Luther lays a heavy emphasis, because the Bible does, upon the words of Christ, that he says all of this, even the sacrament itself, is founded on the words which Christ spoke. And so we're going to keep that in mind and keep your ears open for that, for when Luther speaks about the words, the words, the words, he'll bring it up time and time again, because the, if the words are the words of Christ, well, then that means something. But if the words are the words of man, well, then we can be rid of them. And Luther says, no, they are the words of Christ. And so we do well to pay attention to them. So as he lays that all out there, then he, he goes right ahead and he says, look, before we get any further discussing the Lord's Supper, let's first hear those words. And you did just hear those words. They're the words of institution. Uh, those words that are so comforting, those words that are so familiar to us, thanks be to God that he gives us those words, our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, and you can go on from there. 
But in particular, he's going to highlight time and time again those words, take, eat, take, drink. This is my body. This is my blood given and shed for you. Uh, that these words are going to mean so much for us as we think about the Lord's Supper. And so he'll get into that really kind of in the second part of all of this. And so that is kind of his introduction, the, the lead into all of this. And he's going to have just a little bit more to say before we get to that first, uh, really that first part, that first question. And so, uh, as I said again, just a reminder before we continue on, if you have any questions, comments along the way, uh, please put those in the comment sections uh, there for me, and I'll get to those as I see them. Uh, greetings to you as well, uh, Pastor Peterson. Great to have you with us. Well, we'll continue on here uh, with page 432. We're right after the words of institution. Luther continues. Here also, we do not wish to enter into controversy and fight with the defamers and blasphemers of this sacrament, but to learn first, as we did with baptism, what is of the greatest importance. The chief point is God's word and ordinance or command. For the sacrament has not been invented nor introduced by any man. Without anyone's counsel and deliberation, it has been instituted by Christ. The Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, and the Creed keep their nature and worth, even if you never keep, pray, or believe them. So also, this honorable sacrament remains undisturbed. Nothing is withdrawn or taken from it, even though we use and administer it unworthily. Do you think God cares about what we do or believe, as though on that account he should allow his ordinance to be changed? Why, in all worldly matters, everything stays the way God has created and ordered it, no matter how we employ or use it. This point must always be taught, for by it the chatter of nearly all the fanatical spirits can be repelled. For they regard the sacraments, unlike God's word, as something that we do. We'll stop right there. And so you see, hopefully you heard that again, where Luther is going to be bringing this point up once again uh, about the word of Christ. Uh, and so as he goes through, right, he goes, we're not trying to enter into this big controversy with people, that this writing is not so much about trying to have an apologetic, having a defense against someone else, but that this large catechism is so much more that we would learn it that we would learn what the sacrament is and we would learn to treasure it all the more, that we would learn to see it as the greatest gift that we could ever receive here in this earth, that we would see the Lord's Supper as the best food we could ever eat and ever drink. And so, as Luther says, not fighting against other people on this is not our aim. No, he says, the chief point is this, God's word an ordinance or command, he says. But you hear it again. He says the chief point God's, is God's word, that God's word is what establishes the supper. God's word is what institutes it. God's word is what keeps it going and continues to, to define what the Lord's supper is. And so really God's word is the chief thing in all of this. Because he goes on really for the rest of the paragraph to kind of say, if we try to mess it up, if we try to change the Lord's Supper, if we think we have the power to do that, well, we're awfully mistaken. That even in that name by which we call it, we see this. It's the Lord's Supper. It's not our Supper. It's His. And so He institutes it, He defines it, and He maintains it. And there's nothing we can do to change that. It is His Supper. And what a great relief that is to us. What a wonderful gift that is to know that our Lord will guard and keep his supper by the authority of his word. And so Luther is really bringing it out right at the beginning that we're not here trying to define the supper in our image. No, we're defining the supper as God defines it. That we're plumbing the depths, if you will, to find out what God tells us about the sacrament. And then 
as he kind of is wrapping all this up, he gives this last line, and we would do so well to listen and to take this to heart because it's so easy for us to kind of think the wrong way here. But he says, all these fanatical spirits, everyone else who really disregards the supper, well, they disregard it. They have a low view of it primarily because they think it's something we do, he says, that we think the Lord's Supper is our action to God, our obedience, our offering to him, that somehow the pastor has a say in it, somehow we as a congregation have a say in it, that, that somehow it's on us by our authority, by our will, by our might. And Luther says, no, when we start thinking about it that way, we enter into all sorts of trouble. We enter into all sorts of error and wandering away from the truth. That as with baptism, so with the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is not an act of man. The Lord's Supper is an act of God. That it is his work beginning, middle, and end. And we're going to see what a great comfort that is. How that really does ease our mind and focus us on that great gift that God is giving us there in Christ's body and blood. And so a wonderful thing that the devil, he loves to kind of whisper in our minds and tell us, hey, it's your work. You've got to do it. You've got to be holy. And we can come back at the devil and say, no, it has nothing to do with me. It's not my work. I could never be worthy on my own. But thanks be to God that it is his work. And when it's his work, and he says, this is given for you, I trust that. And I know that it is all on him. And he never lies. He never deceives. He only gives us these great gifts. And so it's a wonderful thing for us to stop every now and then and to, to think back on this point. That it's not about God. Or it's not about our work. It's about God's work. That he's the one who establishes the supper. He's the one who feeds the supper. He's the one who guards the supper and keeps the supper. What a wonderful thing that is. And so that's really kind of Luther's uh, intro to it, to get our minds in the right place, right? To get us ready to, to really hear all about the Lord's Supper. And so we'll pick it up here towards the bottom of page 432 uh, as Luther gets into that first part. And really the first question uh, that he says is, what is the sacrament? What is it? And we'll pick it up here, the bottom of page 432. Luther writes, now, what is the sacrament of the altar? Answer, it is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in and under the bread and wine with which we Christians are commanded by Christ's word to eat and to drink. Just as we have said that about that baptism, not sorry, just as we have said that baptism is not simple water, so here also, we say that though the sacrament is bread and wine, it is not mere bread and wine, such as are ordinarily served at the table. And he's citing there 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 and 17. But this is bread and wine included in and connected with God's word. Now you heard that there a couple times as we'll stop and kind of consider this now. So he says, what is the Lord's Supper? And he says, well, answer, right? He gives it to you right away. And what is it? It is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, there's so much packed into that. But, but we, as we stop here and think about that, notice that word true. It is the true body and blood of Christ. It's not some sort of representation. It's not some sort of a symbol. It's not some sort of a spiritual reality. It is true. It is real. It is actually his body and blood. And so Luther says right away, this is how we are to regard it. It is the body and blood of Christ. And as he says there, in and under, we like to add with sometimes, in, with, and under, the bread and the wine. Now that's usually where we would stop our answer. But Luther includes this second part, this kind of second clause to it. It's the true body and blood of Christ in and with the bread and the wine. But, he says, it's that body and blood which we are commanded by Christ's word to eat and drink. 
that he's kind of showing us here as Christians, we eat the supper. Uh, that's what a Christian does. A Christian eats and drinks the body and blood of Christ. And we do it, again, by the word. Because the word of God says so. Think about those words that we hear. This do in remembrance of me. That we do this in remembrance of our Lord's words. We do this because we know he is giving us great gifts there. And so Luther says, here it is. That's what the sacrament of the altar is. That we start there with a bold confession that this bread and wine is also the body and blood of Christ as it is connected with the word of God. And he continues on in that where he says, now look, it's not just bread and wine, right? But it's bread and wine that's connected with God's word. And so he's kind of fighting that battle where sometimes we go, well, what is it? Is it just body and blood or is it bread and wine? Well, he's saying, yeah, it's, it's both. It's body and blood and it's bread and wine. Now, I see how I have a question here. Uh, Barb asks, what is meant by in and under? Uh, that's an excellent question. And quite frankly, I'm not sure if I'll do it perfect justice here, but I'll give it a shot for you. Uh, in and under, uh, and we add with sometimes, these are kind of, uh, in a way, they're, they're philosophical um, ideas to try to describe it, right? So we say, it is Christ's body and blood in and under the bread, which means, okay, it's in it, right? So it's in the bread itself, but also it's under, that it's kind of supporting it, right, in, in a way. That not only is the substance of the bread the body of Christ, but also it's underneath, right? That it is the support, it is the thing that's sort of holding it up. Now, there's a little bit more uh, depth to that, and, and I would have to brush up more before I let you down this route, uh, that has to do sometimes with like Aristotle and, and the ideas of, of physics and, and some of this kind of stuff. But really, when we, when we try to understand in and under, and even when you throw with in there, in, with, and under, it's saying really at its core, on the outside, underneath, above, all around, it is the body and blood of Christ. Uh, in that bread and in that wine. Uh, and so, as I said, it is, it's uh, kind of an interesting phrase. I'm glad you asked that question because uh, it, it's trying to get at this reality that we can't kind of break the bread open and go, okay, here's the bread and, and here's the body, right? We kind of separate them out. That in and under is trying to say the entirety of it, through and through. It's simultaneously bread and body. It's simultaneously wine and blood. Uh, and in a way that we can't really get, and I kind of compare it here to the two natures of Christ. Well, is Christ 100% God? You, you bet he is. Is he 100% man? You bet he is. But how does that work? Well, he's still 100% God, 100% man, and yet he's 100% Christ. Uh, he's not somehow 200%. And it's in a mystery, in a way we can't quite understand it. And in and under is kind of trying to get at that reality. Uh, so hopefully that, that kind of helps answer the question. As I said, I, I have to probably brush up a little bit more on some of the technical terminology there. But that's really kind of a good way to start understanding it. That it, it's trying to show the entirety of the bread and the wine is the body and blood of Christ. It's in it. It's under it. It's with it, kind of around it. Uh, that's really what we mean when we use that phrase. So hopefully that helped there, Barb, and, and everyone else who was kind of wondering the same thing. Excellent question. And so as Luther says this, I, I want to emphasize here the last point on this paragraph that he says again, hey, look, it's bread and wine that's included in and connected with God's word. That again, Luther's bringing it right back to God's word. Why does this happen? Because of God's word. And this is going to be important as we kind of step forward in some of this. That sometimes in history we've gotten the argument. We get it even today. Well, that doesn't make sense, right? How can this bread and wine also be body and blood? And either on the one hand, one side we get people saying it has to change into it. So there's no more bread and wine. Or on the other side we get people saying, no, it's just bread and wine. And it just sort of represents body and blood. Well, Luther's saying, no, look, God's word says this bread is body. This wine is blood. We don't understand how this happens, but we know God's word says it. 
And so we'll believe it. We'll confess it. We'll teach it. Because when God's word is involved, well, anything is possible. And as the Lord speaks it, and the Lord is always true, he does not deceive or lie, we know that the Lord's Supper is bread and wine, but also body and blood. And so that foundation of God's word is so vitally important as we begin to understand the sacrament here. So let's move on. Uh, double check comments here, make sure. All right, so very good. We'll move on to the next paragraph here. Luther writes, It is the word, I say, that makes and sets this sacrament apart. So it is not mere bread and wine, but it is and is called Christ's body and blood. And he cites the words of institution from 1 Corinthians 11 there. For it is said, when the word is joined to the element or natural substance, it becomes a sacrament. This saying of St. Augustine is so properly and so well put that he has scarcely said anything better. The word must make a sacrament out of the element or else it remains a mere element. Now, it is not the word or ordinance of a prince or emperor, but it is the word of the grand majesty at whose feet all creatures should fall and affirm that it is, as he says, and accept it with all reverence, fear, and humility. And he cites there Isaiah 45, verse 23, but also Philippians 2, verse 10. And so as we stop there, uh, kind of as we've been picking up on this, now Luther makes it very clear, right? He says, it's the word, the word I say, that makes and sets the sacrament apart. And he gets into that quote from Augustine at that point, where he says, well, if we just have the elements, they remain elements. We can do whatever we want, but if that's all we have, it's just going to be bread and wine. But... When the word of God comes to those elements, well, then it becomes a sacrament, right? And this is probably a good time to talk real briefly about what the word sacrament means. Now, the word sacrament is actually a Latin term that really translates the word mystery. It's a mystery. When we call something a sacrament, uh, that word, the, the origin of it is mystery. And that's really quite beautiful when we consider uh, our two sacraments of Holy Baptism and the Lord's Supper, that how can simple water do this? Well, it's not just water, it's water with the word of God. Well, how can bread and wine do this? Well, it's not bread and wine, it's bread and wine with the word of God. And we don't know how this all happens. It's a mystery how God works in this way, and yet it's not a mystery that he works this way. We know it because he tells us that. And it's also not a mystery why he's working this way. Well, he's working this way to give us his good gifts. And that's why also it's not a mystery as to what he's doing. He's bringing us life and salvation. And so as we say it, though, as we talk about a sacrament, we say it is only a sacrament once that word of God comes to an element. You know, this is one of those questions that I'll, I'll drill into our catechumens, our, our confirmands, as we're going through class, that there's three things that make a sacrament. Well, one, you've got to have some sort of a visible element that is connected also with the Word of God, right? And that's kind of what we've been talking about here. Two, the sacrament has to be instituted by Christ himself. And then three, the sacrament has to give the forgiveness of sins. And so as we kind of think about those three points, we realize what happens in holy baptism. Well, we have an element, water, connected with the word of God. It's instituted by Christ. Go, therefore, and baptize. And it also gives the forgiveness of sins. Well, the same thing happens in the Lord's Supper. We have our elements, bread and wine, and they're connected with the word of God when we say those words of institution. And as we, even in those words, you hear it, it is instituted by Christ, right? We hear it, our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, and he institutes the supper, and it gives us the forgiveness of sins for that third point, right? Uh, and so, as Luther, he, he's kind of making sure we get that first part of what a sacrament is. We have the elements, and we attach the word of God to it. 
right? So he's really making sure that, that point is laid before our eyes here. And so we see that the, the sacrament uh, and the word of God, those two go together hand in hand here. Uh, and he really ends it there with a point we've made, but I'll just kind of put it together one last time here for us, that he says, these words, and I like how he puts it, aren't the words of a prince or emperor, right? In this world, a prince, an emperor, uh, a president, a king, whatever it might be, when they say something, usually it's going to happen, right? That's the way our world works. And yet, even the words of a prince or an emperor, of a king or a president, could not make the Lord's Supper the Lord's Supper. Even the words of a king or an emperor could not make bread and wine the body and blood of Christ. But only the words of God can do that. And so Luther gives us this great comfort, right? That he says, no, it's not the word of man. It's not our action. It's not our doing. It is the word of God. Uh, it is the word, as he says, of the grand majesty, the one at whose feet we all must bow. And so Luther says it there at the end, and something that, that as Lutherans we know so well, when God says it, even if it doesn't quite make sense, even if we can't kind of put all the pieces together ourselves. But we believe it, that we know he is uh, truthful, that, that he does not lie, that what he says happens. I mean, go back to creation with this. When God spoke, boom, there it was. Well, the same thing here with the sacrament. When God speaks, when he says, this is my body, there it is. It's not man's word, it's God's word. And God's word is always bringing this about. And so Luther uh, really is bringing that point home here for us. So now we'll continue with that next paragraph. Luther writes, With this word, you can strengthen your conscience and say, If a hundred thousand devils, together with all fanatics, should rush forward crying, How can bread and wine be Christ's body and blood? And such, I know that all spirits and scholars together are not as wise as is the divine majesty in his little finger. And he cites there 1 Corinthians 1 25. Now here stands Christ's word. Take, eat. This is my body. Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament. And so on. Here we stop to watch those who will call themselves his masters and make the matter different from what he has spoken. It is true, indeed, that if you take away the word or regard the sacrament without the words, you have nothing but mere bread and wine. But if the words remain with them, as they shall and must, then by virtue of the words, it is truly Christ's body and blood. What Christ's lips say and speak so it is. He can never lie or deceive. And he cites there Titus 1, verse 2. And so I love this imagery that Luther lays out here. He says, if a hundred thousand devils came running at you saying, this isn't Christ's body and blood, right? What's, what's our reaction? Well, he says, what? I know they're wrong, right? Even a hundred thousand of them have less wisdom combined, you got to love Luther here, than God's little finger. What a beautiful thing for us to say, right? If all the might of men, if all the smartest people in on our planet today came together and did all their scientific experiments on the Lord's Supper and, and they reasoned through it and they told us we can conclude 100% that it's not Christ's body and blood, we can say, well, that's nice, but God is smarter than you, and he says it is. The God who knows all things, who institutes all things, who knows things we can't even fathom, tells us this is Christ's body and blood. And we'll believe him, that we're going to believe what our Lord and our Creator says, because he is the one who has all wisdom. Uh, and that, that verse from 1 Corinthians even says, what is foolishness to God is actually wisdom to man. And that's an amazing thing to think about. What is something kind of silly and foolish to God we consider to be the greatest wisdom, right? 
because God is that wise. He is that all-knowing that we can't even fathom it. And so a wonderful comfort here. When you hear people attacking the sacrament, when you hear people trying to destroy your faith in the body and blood of Christ, we turn back to God. We turn back to his word. And we read again what he says. This is my body. This is my blood. I just think Luther here, such a beautiful and comforting statement that he gives us to remind us time and time again that God is far greater than any man, uh, that God's wisdom far surpasses human understanding. And so he says that, right? He, he brings up the words of institution, and then he makes this point, right? We've emphasized so much the importance of the word that he said, he kind of, kind of finally comes down and says it. If you take away the word, if, if you separate the word of God from the Lord's Supper, well, then you just have bread and wine, right? Then if we just distribute out some bread and wine and say, don't worry, uh, eat it, it's the Lord's Supper, we don't actually speak God's word. If we aren't there in prayer and singing out his word and, and speaking those words of institution and, and doing all of this stuff, if we're not centered on God's word, bringing God's word to those elements. It's just bread and wine. And so he, he, he reminds us there, as long as the word is present, there it is. There's the sacrament. Uh, and he, that's really where he ends it, right? That he says here, what Christ's lips speak and say, so it is. And so when you when we get that joy of coming back together in church and and finally celebrate the Lord's Supper again all together, what a joyous thing it'll be to hear the the really the voice of Christ in himself crying out to us, take eat. This is my body. This is my blood. Because as Christ says it, so it is. And so Luther is kind of, this is his final point as far as God's word in this section is concerned about how God's word is so central to understanding the Lord's Supper, to really appreciating this great sacrament. And now we'll get his final point on this. And I'll give just a little preface to this paragraph. So as you're listening, you can kind of understand where we're going. That sometimes the, uh, really the objection can be raised. Well, who can really do the, uh, kind of preside over the sacrament? Who can be the one up there doing it? Uh, does it have to be someone who's holy, who's righteous, who's, you know, or what happens if it's not? What happens if an imposter is our pastor? If, if somewhere in our past, something like this happens? Well, Luther says, fear not. Uh, it, it's not up to the man. It's up to God. It's up to God's word to really bring it about. And so just kind of be thinking about some of those issues as you hear this next paragraph. This will be a, a little longer than any of the other ones we've done. So just uh, kind of hang in there and we'll kind of piece it apart at the very end. So Luther writes, It is easy to reply to all kinds of questions about which people are troubled at the present time, such as this one. Can even a wicked priest serve at and administer the sacrament, and whatever other questions like this there may be. For here we conclude and say, even though an imposter takes or distributes the sacrament, a person still receives the true sacrament, that is, Christ's true body and blood, just as truly as a person who receives or administers it in the most worthy way. For the sacrament is not founded upon people's holiness, but upon God's word. Just as no saint on earth, indeed no angel in heaven, can make bread and wine be Christ's body and blood, so also no one can change or alter it, even though it is misused. The word by which it became a sacrament and was instituted does not become false because of the person or his unbelief. For Christ does not say, if you believe or are worthy, you receive my body and blood. No, he says, take, eat, and drink. This is my body and blood. Likewise, he says, do this, i.e., what I now do 
Institute, institute, give, and ask you, take. That is like saying, no matter whether you are worthy or unworthy, you have here his body and blood by virtue of these words that are added to the bread and wine. Note and remember this well, for upon these words rest all our foundation, protection, and defense against all errors and deception that have ever come or may yet come. And he ends there. So we have in a brief way covered the first point that deals with this sacrament's essence. So we'll stop right there and we'll kind of try to piece this together a little bit. Uh, and it's uh, kind of an interesting point for us to take, but certainly a good one uh, and certainly a comforting one for us throughout our lives. Then he says, look, there's a lot of questions out there about whether or not the sacrament is the sacrament and what affects that. And he says one of those questions, and it was very big in his day, and it can even still be that way in our day. He says, can a wicked person, a wicked priest rather, serve at and administer the sacrament? And really the question here is, uh, we have a pastor, right? And we find out later that our pastor is actually an unbeliever, right? Well, do we have to doubt all those times we received the Lord's Supper? Were those all of a sudden not the Lord's Supper because the guy in charge was an unbeliever? And, and you really see this isn't so much a silly question. Uh, this is a real concern that we can have, uh, that we don't want to be standing there wondering, hey, is Pastor really a believer? You know, is Pastor Sorensen just duping us here? Or is he actually a real believer? Because... I want the Lord's Supper. Well, Luther says, it's kind of the wrong question, right? He says uh, in here, even though an imposter takes or distributes the sacrament, right? Even though someone who might be fooling us, might be tricking us, might making us think they're a believer, even though he might try to, to give us the sacrament and administer it to us, well, what? Joke's on him. We still receive it. We still get Christ's body and blood. So even though he's an imposter, even though he doesn't believe, we still get the goods. We still get what God is coming to give us. What an amazing thing this is. And Luther, of course, he's going to really show us why this is the case. And, and this one again, and I'll read this uh, again, this sentence for us. For the sacrament is not founded upon people's holiness, but upon God's word. Then again, we see that, right? It's God's word that makes the sacrament, not how holy the pastor is. If it was about how holy the pastor is, then I'm sorry, uh, we would not have the sacrament. I'm not nearly holy enough in myself. It could never happen. No pastor could. But when it's on God's word, when it depends on God's word alone, well, then we have the utmost faith and confidence that we receive the Lord's Supper. And Luther kind of builds off this point by saying, look, no man, not even an angel, is going to change this. When the Lord's word is attached to the elements, we have the Lord's Supper. We absolutely do. It's not our action. It's not dependent on us to bring it about. Now, as he's talking about this, though, I do want to make sure that we keep kind of keep it straight. We're not saying, uh, when, when Luther brings this up, what he's not saying is that just anybody can run up to the altar and, and really administer the Lord's sacrament, right? That's not what he's getting at. That we still maintain a good order in our church. Uh, that we still have a rightly called and ordained pastor uh, who is really put there to, to do this, to bring the words Lord and sacrament to us. Uh, and so he's not trying to tell us we're just going to do a lottery to pick our next person to, to celebrate the sacrament. But what he's trying to show us is when we have the sacrament, don't focus on the guy, right? Don't focus on the pastor and who he is and whether you, you like him or not or whether you think he's holy or not. Don't worry if you think his faith is strong enough. None of that matters. That it all rests on God's word. Did the pastor speak? God's word? If he did, then you're good. And if he didn't, well, then we have a question. We have, to, we have to address this. But Luther is showing us 
when you hear those words, our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When you hear this, when you hear the word of God being proclaimed, added to, included with those elements, you can rush up to that altar. You can grab hold of the sacrament and know for sure that it is the body and blood of Christ. And this is where, now Luther isn't going to mention this here, uh, but this is where too, uh, that our vestments will kind of show this to us. This is why the pastor will wear that, that big vestment that we call a chasuble that covers him up. Because as he goes to the sacrament, just that, that chasuble, that vestment over top of him is really trying to show us with our eyes. Don't look at him. Don't look at the man. Listen to the word. Listen to the word of God because that will will be what makes the sacrament come about. That is what will bring you the sacrament, which will uh, join that bread and wine together and have the body and blood of Christ present as well. And so Luther, he's really kind of answering some of these questions here for us. And as he gets down to the end, right, he says, don't worry if you're worthy or unworthy, right? Worry about the word. As long as the word is there, you know you have the sacrament. And what a blessed gift this is. And I love how he ends it. Upon these words rest all our foundation, protection, and defense. That as long as we cling to those words of God, as long as we cling uh, to the, the words of institution and what he says about the sacrament, well, then we can be sure and certain that we are protected against error that we are defended against the assaults of the devil, uh, and that we're even defended against our sinful flesh, which is going to try so hard to take those words away and make it all about us. But as long as we rest on those words, we have the sacrament. We have Christ's body and blood. We have it for our good. And this is a beautiful thing. Uh, As we consider that first question, what is the sacrament? And now we can confidently say it is the true body and blood of Christ in and under and with the bread and wine because it's attached to God's word. And it's commanded for us to eat and drink again by the word of God for our own benefit and good. And really that last part there is where we'll be headed next week. Uh, As our time today will be kind of coming to a close here. Uh, that next week, Luther is going to take us from this point, understanding what the sacrament is, and start talking about what benefits it gives, right? In other words, why do we do it? Why do we have the Lord's Supper? Why is it so important in our lives? Now, of course, you're going to know a bunch of those answers already, and yet next week we'll get to dive into that and really see the wonderful comfort, the wonderful gifts that Christ is giving us through his very body and blood, in, with, and under the bread and wine. And so there, uh, that'll kind of be a a good stopping point for us here today. Uh, And I'll give you maybe just another minute or two. If you have any questions or comments kind of on this first part, again, you can put them down there in the comment section, uh, and we can bring those up. But uh, what a wonderful thing to see as we start talking about uh, the Lord's Supper here, to just take a step back. Uh, We all know Uh, We all confess together, it's the body and blood of Christ. And yet now, hopefully, uh, you you get a fuller sense of of how this is the case, why this is the case, and how we see that from Scripture, right? How we understand it from Christ's own word himself. And as you kind of venture out, uh, as you talk to family and friends and and years to come here, this will also give you a good way uh, to really speak about it, to confess the faith, to say, no, we, we believe it's the Lord's Supper, and we, we found that upon God's word. And it's a really a beautiful thing for us to be able to, to see and confess together. So now I see, I think I got a few more comments or questions here. Let me see. All right, I see one here from Michelle. Uh, if you cannot take the sacrament, is asking for forgiveness for your sins just as good? Well, this is really a good question. Uh, And I would say, on the one hand, yes, right? On the one hand, absolutely, that we can go and uh, pray to our Lord and ask for forgiveness of sins. Uh, And also, you know, the offer is always on the table. Anytime you want to come and visit me, uh, perhaps when we're not under lockdown, uh, but anytime you want to come, even now, if your sins are burdening you, uh, to receive the Lord's absolution, his forgiveness, one-on-one, 
uh, that that is always open for you. But certainly, uh, kind of to your question here, Michelle, uh, you certainly can pray to the Lord for forgiveness and know for sure that it is yours. Uh, and what we're going to see is while the, the sacrament does also give us forgiveness, and this is a huge part of the sacrament, uh, that there's even more that it gives. Uh, and so it's a great question that you ask because uh, certainly we know uh, that it's not just the forgiveness of sins, but there's also so many other benefits that come with it, right? That come with receiving the sacrament. And yet we also know we have that forgiveness in our baptism. We know we can pray to the Lord for forgiveness. I uh, just think the Lord's prayer here, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And then it's our great joy. Uh, yeah. Once we can join together again to receive the sacrament to go, ah, oh, now we get that forgiveness again in a different way, in another way. It's God heaping this forgiveness uh, kind of on top of itself, an overabundance. I, I mean, I can't help but think of Psalm 23 here. My cup overflows, right? And so, yeah, during these days in particular, you know, when we, when we might be separated from the sacrament for just a little bit, uh, pray, pray to the Lord, pray the Lord's prayer, ask for forgiveness that that is certainly a wonderful gift that our Lord gives us to be able to do just that. So excellent question there, Michelle. Hopefully that, that helps answer it there for you a little bit. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. Uh, and so if there's any others, get them in here right now, uh, and I'll try to answer them before we stop for the day. Otherwise, I'll kind of look ahead for you. Uh, so this Sunday, I'll be posting a sermon on our website again. Uh, so you can uh, go there and listen to our the sermon on Sunday. Uh, and then next week, we'll, we'll do this again. Uh, we'll pick up again on Tuesday at about 2 o'clock with our uh, Philippians Bible study. On Wednesday, we'll look at the hymn, A Lamb Goes, The Lamb Goes Uncomplaining Forth. I believe that's 438 uh, in your hymnal, but you might want to double check that. Uh, and then next Thursday, we'll pick this up again. We'll pick up our large catechism and we'll keep discussing uh, what the benefits of the Lord's Supper are. So thank you so much for joining me here today. I uh, certainly pray the Lord's blessings upon you all, that he would keep, keep us safe and healthy during these days. And before we close, let, let us join in prayer together. We pray, Almighty God, Heavenly Father, give us grace to trust you during this time of illness and distress. In mercy, put an end to the epidemic that afflicts us all. Grant relief to those who suffer, and comfort all who mourn. Sustain all medical personnel in their labors and cause your people ever to serve you in righteousness and holiness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And with that, I pray the Lord's richest blessings on you uh, as we continue on with our days and on our weeks here. And, and one final encouragement for you, uh, that I want everyone to know that I am still here for you. Uh, that if you need anything at all, uh, even just a phone call, if you want to receive the sacrament, uh, if you need any help in any sort of way, please give me a call. Uh, shoot me a text or an email that I am here for you. I am here to serve you with Christ's gifts, with his word and with his sacrament, and to be with you in the midst of all of this, uh, to bring all of us that peace of Christ, that peace which passes all understanding. So certainly I pray that the peace of Christ would be with you, during these days and that he would guard and keep us safe until we can join together again and celebrate as one body uh, within the church around his word and his sacrament. So the Lord's blessings be with you and have a great day.